I wanted to welcome everyone. Happy New Year. Um, happy 2021. So hopefully this will be a little bit better of a year than last year. Uh, we have a very exciting topic today. We're going to talk about innovation and how um, innovation can lead to exponential growth. So you must have all seen Sam's bio um, and I'll leave the details to him. So when he's um, takes over, he'll go over some of that. I just wanted to remind everyone that we have a website, icsanteaters.org. So please visit that, which also has links to follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Slack, um, our email, and these replays of these videos um, are on YouTube, as well as our website. Uh, we have our lunch and learns. Our plan is to still keep them the first Fridays of every month. The next one will be Friday, February 5th, and we are hoping to put together a very exciting panel for Black History Month. March will be Women's History Month, and we are looking for speakers for all months for the panels as well as um, March and beyond. So if you have an interesting topic or your subject matter expert, please reach out to us. And if you know someone, please connect us. So we're always looking. And we also want to incorporate some social events like a Jackbox night or tech scavenger hunt. So we look be on the lookout for some of those emails and messages. And another exciting thing, if you guys attended our November Lunch and Learn, was we have an AntNet uh, site page. So I recommend everyone to sign up on AntNet. We're going to have our ICS. That's the official way to network and start some mentorship. So without further ado, um, Sam, take it away. Great. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Let me go ahead and put my screen up here. All right. You can see that okay? Perfect. All right. Yeah, so thank you very much for having me today. It's honestly an honor to be here. It's very interesting always having kind of Zoom presentations versus in-person presentations. I'm a very personal person. So it's, you know, you might see my hands going outside of the screen wondering what I'm doing, but it's just because I like to, you know, talk with my hands and my body and walk across the stage and things like that. So sitting in a seat might be a little difficult for me. So, you know, bear with me. And uh, if I talk too fast or move too quickly, you know, I'm happy to go back over that when we have a little bit of time at the end for questions and, uh, and answers there. So uh, a little bit more about me, I'll talk about that and I'll talk a little bit about what the topic is for today. So I'm a, a serial entrepreneur. I also am what we consider an intrapreneur if you're familiar with those terms. So I kind of run startups by night. I do a handful of different things anywhere from consulting startups to actually running my own startups. You'll see some of the logos down there at the bottom. And I also work for a company called Talus, which is an aerospace company. I'm in their in-flight entertainment division and I lead their research technology and innovation department and also run all of their intellectual property. Uh, so that I'm their intellectual property manager as well. So I've done uh, a lot of different things, you know, kind of surrounding innovation and patents. And as I've navigated over the years, I originally started as a mechanical engineer uh, in Germany, working on concept cars. That was my dream. I always wanted to be an engineer that designed really, really cool and fancy cars which I absolutely loved. But what I really found is that I started to kind of love the process more than the end product in many cases. And I started to really enjoy working with people. Um, and that really led me to a, a slightly different role. So over the years, I've kind of transitioned through a handful of different roles, uh, mostly within engineering. And then I started to kind of back out a little bit um, from being a very tactical engineer to someone that helped to, um, bring engineers together to help innovate and create. And I've done that in a handful of different ways. And some of those I'll talk a little bit about today on how we can kind of create exponential go growth within innovation you know, using some of those uh, those techniques. So yeah, the, the startups down here at the bottom, I have a couple of those um, that, that we could talk about in a future date. One of them is out of the box and that's kind of an in innovation consulting firm. So it's mostly directly related to kind of this conversation today. So I do partner with some other corporations to help them be more creative and innovative because as you probably know and understand many large you know, corporations as they transition from this startup into more of a structural organization, they 
typically start to lack some of that quick and repetitive innovation. So I help them kind of bring that nature back internally and not just externally. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So in terms of the topic for today, I wanted to kind of go over four different growth types. And you may have seen some of these, if not all of them, because they're uh, more and more of a common topic that you'll see today or in, in this day and age, especially on the exponential side. So you probably heard that term very often. I'll talk a little bit about it today. But since that is more of a common theme that you may hear more often, I didn't want to get into too many details of that. Um, because it's something that is becoming more natural and not, not something necessarily that we're um, chasing after anymore. So the one topic that I really want to focus is kind of on this new line. And this is more of a theory that I've been working on based off of the innovation and the ways of thinking that I found working with engineers and other entrepreneurs and investors all over the world of different ways for us to kind of approach things. And I think what has happened over the last decades is that people typically kind of box in their thinking, even, even in this very creative and innovative um, you know, environment that we're in this day and age with so many different technologies at our fingertips, we still typically have this kind of linear way of thinking that you'll see on the graph there is we always plan you know, in steps, if you're going to plan something, you almost always plan, you know, X, Y, and Z. And there's always some exponential curve to some things in technology, but typically we're kind of in the box thinkers. Um, and that has limited us very, very much in the past uh, for how we tend to work with others and interact as engineers, as interact as creators and innovators. Uh, so I wanted to kind of break those boundaries a little, a little bit. And on that new curve, I'll give you a little bit of more tangible, practical ways that we've utilized it. And I've personally utilized it in my personal growth outside of just my you know, business and, and corporate growth uh, as well. So the first one linear, I'll go through a couple of these very quickly because they're very simple, but just to kind of ramp up to where we're going. Uh, and I like to really relate them to financial growth because one, I feel like typically a lot of us leave, I, I left with my, uh, my master's degree and I, I really still had a hard time with my personal finances. I kind of had a good understanding of how to run a business, but when it came to my personal finances, it was still you know, tough. And I feel like I have had a lot of feedback in the years um, previous from you know, startups or individuals saying they still have a hard time with you know, personal financials. So I, sometimes I like to relate innovation uh, to finance because it gives you a correlation and something tangible that you really can you know, dive into and understand how it is really applicable uh, to innovation. So yeah, in linear, I like to think of finance as like a savings account, right? When you grew up, maybe a lot of us like myself, my father typically said, hey, any additional money that you can spare, you put into a very simplistic CD account, 401k, whatever you can, that had this kind of linear growth. But the thing was, it was a sure thing, right? You, you, when you plan linear growth, you could pretty much predict very accurately where you're going to be in an allotted timeline. So that's a linear growth path, and it's still used very often today, whether it's in finances, you know, education, right? When we go through education, typically it's linear. Nobody's going from their high school degree to their doctorate degree without anything in the middle. Um, and the uh, same thing in, in corporations you see very often. You know, I'm in an aerospace corporation, so that's even more so. It's not like a flat um, corporation like you see within, you know, Google's and some of the more technical uh, um corporates, but it's, you have to work up this hierarchy. And I've done that. I think probably some of you have done that. And I know many of my friends, that's their goal is they just want to move up the hierarchy in this kind of bit linear path. They think if they put in so many years, they're going to get to a, a specific point, which works, it's proven, but it's very slow. And then on innovation, there's incremental. So when we plan innovation, you'll usually have two discussions. You have disruptive, and then you have incremental and incremental is something that's just, you know, one after the other, you think of an iPhone, almost every, you could plan pretty much. We know the iPhone 13 is coming out. We know the iPhone 14 is coming out and you have just some little additional features. You have a new camera, you have a new, you know, a user interface, you know, a couple of little things, but it's very planned. Uh, and you kind of expect it to happen as technology increases. Uh, so that's kind of more on the incremental side. The next term is what I like to consider explosive. 
And not too many people talk about this because it could be looked at in you know, a positive and negative light, but just to shine light on from my perspective, uh, from a financial view, this is something like the lottery where you know, if, if you were going to say, hey, I want to become extremely wealthy, most of you, I would hope being very well educated, you would not say, I'm gonna just every single day, I'm gonna go buy a lotto ticket. Maybe you do, and maybe it works for you, I hope so. But uh, most people do not plan that out. They're going to say, hey, I'm going to take any additional savings that I have, and I'm just going to put a lotto ticket. I, I know that there was some recent uh, graduates. I want to say it's from Princeton. Maybe some of you know, or, or Yale that did. Uh, they actually looked at the statistics, right? And they put, I can't remember how much it was, a big lump sum of money into buying lottery tickets because they know statistically at some threshold they were going to win. So that's a little bit of a different story. But uh, I, on, on this path, you typically don't go and say, I'm just going to invest my whole life. I'm hoping that one day I hit the lottery. And it's kind of the same way with innovation. Unfortunately, this uh, type of innovation is looked at as more of a positive light. You see a lot of people that are breaking off into startups or even within corporations. Uh, they create departments, right? Just innovation. And all they're going to focus on is waiting for this kind of big bang innovation, whether it's a product or a service or something that's really groundbreaking and anything that comes under, you know, uh, uh, this kind of incremental side, like we talked about on the, on the linear growth is typically falling under like engineering or somebody else that says, oh, this is just kind of your roadmap on a year to year basis. And we want something big bang that's going to be extremely disruptive. And it's, you know, the truth is you really, really don't see that type of innovation too often. It happens, as you know, but it's not something that typically you plan for. A lot of times it actually happens on accident. There's some processes that you can go through to try to help, you know, this kind of big bang innovation. But it's, again, not something that's one, extremely, extremely predictive. Uh, and two, a lot of times it's actually accidental. So if you were looking at, you know, your finances or an innovation, you know, or your personal development, typically an explosive growth path is not something that you're going to, to seek. It works. Maybe you play it on the side, you know, through stocks. Maybe, maybe you're somebody that's into Bitcoin and says, hey, I'm playing the lottery with Bitcoin and it, you recently just won. So that's great. But overall, we don't plan for explosive uh, types of finances and innovation typically. The next one is leverage. And this one's a very interesting one on both finance and innovation. So leverage uh, for finance is something that we use very often. I'll go through some of those. Innovation's a little bit different on how we use those, but again, something that we use on kind of a day-to-day -day basis. So what I call as standard, and I'll tell you a little bit later why I consider the standard financial leverage um, is very, very common, right? You go and buy a house. So you leverage the bank to buy your house. Uh, a better example is your business because you're leveraging money in order for you to reinvest that money into a business in order to have some return on that investment education, vehicles, right? You typically go out, if you're going to buy a work vehicle, you may leverage the money from the bank, especially now with like extremely low rates, you're going to go leverage the bank in order for you to make more money. So if you say my car payment or my truck payments, $500 a month, but I'm going to have a gardening services that bring me $2,000 a month, you're leveraging the bank's money for that 500 in order for you or 500 a month in order for you to have that $1,500 return. So it's very, very standard as of now. You can actually have um, a growth path, as you see kind of in the, in the chart behind, that has kind of this almost explosiveness to it because you might have a quick return and then you have to try to kind of go back and decipher how your business or how the innovation is going to grow from there. Uh, maybe you have you know, some deficits where you need more products or you need more marketing, so you need more leverage, so you borrow money again and you reinvest it and you have an explosion. So uh, you do have kind of a pretty good growth path actually with uh, a standard financial financial uh, uh, leverage in this one as well. With uh, innovative leverage, you see more of uh, us leveraging technology. So in what I do for the company I work for, Talis, we do this very often because we're in aerospace, we're in commercial airlines. We typically aren't the groundbreakers because when we have a lot more uh, legalities to get through because we have FAA and other big regulating bodies. Uh, two, we have technology boundaries, right? We have uh, bandwidth constraints on the aircraft. 
whether it's cost or actually the size of the bandwidth that we have in terms of connectivity. And then there's a time for us to actually get it into the air. So we can't just take, you know, something from off the shelf, like a, you know, iPad or a fire stick or a new 5G phone and directly input it into an aircraft because you have to have certain regulations, like I said, and, and, and form factors and things like this. So what we typically do for our leverage and innovation is we leverage existing technology. So, you know, all of these that you're very common with, you know, uh, familiar with Bluetooth, 5G, AI, ML, very big buzzwords now, are leveraged by us or others in order for them to create new service products and offerings. So a very good example of what we've done recently is we wanted to bring a conversational AI into the air. So as we went through kind of this COVID pandemic, or we're still in the midst of this COVID pandemic and people are really concerned about flying, one of the concerns is obviously interaction with other people, especially the crew uh, that may be interacting with a lot of people. So we wanted to be able to have a conversational chatbot that would really kind of replace uh, or let's say assist the crew or the pilots in interacting with individuals without having to you know, go there physically. And it would still provide the same type of user experience without it feel like you're talking, everybody hates the chatbots when you're like on the, you know, banking account and it pops up and you're like, oh man, you know, I don't, I know this is a robot or somebody that has no clue what they're doing. So we wanted it to be very, very natural. So of course we do have some research uh, um, resources that are very well, well versed in AI and ML, but instead of us just going back and saying, hey, let's design something brand new a lot of this technology already exists. So we go and leverage with AI Watson or whatever it may be in order for that to be a catalyst to kind of uh, uh, launch us into the future or catapult our, our development into the future without having to build it from the ground up. So this is what I would consider a standard innovation leverage. The next one is exponential and I'll spend a, just a couple of minutes on this one because uh, maybe half of you are really, really familiar with it. Maybe the other half, you know, are have just heard the word, but it's a difficult kind of word to to digest because one, even if you've heard of it and you've seen the charts and I'll share some of that with you, it's something that you say, okay, how is this truly applicable to me? It's almost a natural curve that happens. Um, within innovation and you'll see that within technology just because it's like with the finance side it's like a compound interest because as you start to build more technology it compounds and, and, and creates more and more and more technology but it's it's really hard to understand okay how is this applicable to me what do i do with exponential innovation how could my business you know or you know my personal development um benefit for this type from this type of exponential uh, uh, innovation or exponential financial. So let me talk a little bit about that. So um, just to give two, two examples, because I always love examples. My dad growing up would always give me an analogy for every single thing. So it, it drove me crazy when I was young, but now I love it. So hopefully you like analogies as well. So there's innovation and finance. So on the finance side, you could think of it as like a compound interest, which gives you kind of this almost exponential growth. An example of this, maybe you've heard this example before, but you have Jen on the left-hand side, uh, Amber on the right, and they both uh, grow up kind of in the same communities. They're looking to invest. And at the early age of 24, Jen gets in there and she starts adding just $3,000 every single year. She does that for 10 years. And then let's say at age 34, she's like, okay, forget it. I'm not going to invest anymore. Then you have Amber on the opposite side. She decides to go through kind of all of her early education, get a good job, and then finally she starts to invest when she has a little bit of extra income at the age of 35. So right when Jen stops investing, she invests the exact same amount, $3,000 every single month. But she does that for 30 years. So she does it all the way till she's ready to retire when she's 65. Well, Jen and Amber both retire at the exact same age of 65. But Jen comes back and she has over $1.1 million in her bank account. And then you have Amber that has just over $600,000 in her bank account. And you think, wow, how is Jen only investing for 10 years, 
but she has far more money than Amber does who invested for 30 years. Well, this is a good example of compound interest, which is very similar to kind of an exponential curve because year after year you get that return. So hopefully you are familiar with that. And if you are not, you know, utilizing the magic of compound interest, you are going to do it tomorrow because it could be a game changer in your life of finance. So, uh, you know, look more into that if that's not a familiar term with you. And then on the innovation side, you've probably seen this curve. I didn't add every single bullet to this because it's a lot of information, but the idea behind exponential growth and technology is essentially, you know, early on, just even 500 years ago, we had a very, 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 very slow curve of growth in technology. And you'd have things come out like the printing press, and then, you know, it'd be a few hundred years, and then you'd have the telescope, and then it'd be a few hundred years, and then you'd have the car. So you had a very kind of small, um, very, let's say, incremental growth in technology and advancements year after year. Then all of a sudden, something very interesting happened around the 60s when you had this first moon landing, and you started to see things arise in technology like the microprocessor and things like this. And we've all lived through it, which is very cool because we're living through it and you're going to see the curve go, you know, even, you know, more exponentially over the next couple of years and, and, and decades. But you start to see really the technologies compounding on top of each other, right? It's almost like the leverage and uh, exponential curve growing together where essentially you start to see the curve go very, very rapidly. And it seems like instead of it being a few years before something changes, it's a few months and then a few days. So a very, very interesting curve to watch. And it's fun to see this year after year as these graphs change, you can look them up online uh, and just kind of watch them on how this growth is really chart starting to change uh, our world. And again, this is like a natural growth. So a lot of you are, you may not be able to be, a, you know, say, I know something tangible I can do to help on this growth, aside from maybe leveraging some of those technologies. So again, it's something that seems a little bit kind of foreign to a lot of people, aside from saying, yeah, okay, the world is changing and things are moving very quick. A good example that I always like to throw out, you know, on, on exponential, just to give an idea of how fast things are moving within the exponential growth is on the kind of the, a, a stepping stone process. So if I were to take you, for instance, to the beach and I drew a line in the sand and I said, OK, take 26 steps you would have a pretty good understanding where you're going to be in 26 steps. You could pretty much throw a stone and say, I'm gonna be right there in 26 steps. It's very, very simple. But if I were to tell you, okay, I want you to take 26 exponential steps and say, okay, the first one is one stride, the second one is two strides and then four strides, et cetera. So 26 times, that means you would have traveled around the earth an entire, uh, t entire time. So you would have traveled the world in, in 26 steps versus just going 26 steps on the beach. So it shows linear versus exponential is drastically different. And if you think of that in accordance to finances or innovation, it really helps to wrap your mind on how fast things are changing exponentially. And you could think of we went 30 steps or 35 on exactly where we would be. So the last thing I wanted to, to kind of talk about is really kind of the meat of, of what today was about. And that's this uh, a term that I've kind of coined as compounding leverage. So what this is, is it's almost like an ex exponential leverage where essentially you can, you can accelerate how fast things are changing. Because when you look at the exponential curve, you typically have a very flat line, right? And then it starts to increase. And that's the same thing that typically you see in your personal business and your finances. But what if there was a way in order for us to leverage early on to accelerate that curve? So in our personal finances and in our business and in our innovation uh, and even in our personal development, we can really accelerate how fast we get to that curve. Because sometimes that flat line takes a lot longer than we would like um, in life. So uh, Two ways, I'll give you an example, and there's a ton of different ways. I try to make these two ways very, very practical. Uh, two of Both of them actually apply to kind of what I do in the startups that I'm working on. So I thought they would be really good examples of how you could use them or how you can apply them you know, to your personal life. So the first one is compounding financial leverage. Uh, a good example of this is, let's say, for instance, that somebody had their house for sale and they wanted $100,000. 
typically what would happen, right, is you're going to go to the bank and you're going to take out a loan for $100,000 or 80 or whatever you need to do in order for that to be covered. So you have to go through kind of a process to leverage that money. But there's a very good chance that the, this person that owns a $100,000 home has one of two things. They either own the house outright or they have an existing mortgage. So what if I were able to take that house over subject to their existing mortgage or, or to their ex existing finances. So essentially, rather than leveraging other people's money, I leverage the house itself and I'm able to take that on at 0% interest. Then the actual market value is uh, $115,000. So let's say that I'm going to resell that house as a wrap and say, I'm going to give that house to somebody else at $115,000 because somebody else would like to leverage the money that I've put up and I'm willing to give it to them at 5% interest. So what that would translate into is essentially that I bought the house at $100,000 leveraging the existing person's either mortgage or their seller finance. I would essentially resell that house very quickly. I would never move in. I would sell it very quickly for $115,000 at $10,000 down and 5% interest. And what that would translate into is my payment to the original owner is 278. My uh, payment from my new owner is essentially 564. So now I have a cash flow every single month without using any of my own personal finances of $286. And essentially I've just wrapped an existing person's house up for somebody else. So I'm using two different things. I'm using uh, um, leverage because I'm leveraging the person's home without having to ever use my own personal finances. So I don't have to go out and get a loan, for instance. And two, I'm able to wrap it up with another interest. So I'm getting some compounding interest on top of my existing leverage. So if you look at that in a third light, the total cost uh, of the loan to the end buyer, so the person that I actually sell it to at that 5%, would be $202,919 uh, and, and plus their down payment. So my total profit would be 107,000 plus or minus. So why am I sharing that? Well, the idea behind this is essentially that you could have accelerated yourself very drastically in your own finances without ever using your own money and wrapping it up with some type of compound interest or exponential growth. And in a very short term, you could get a high return on your investment, again, without having to do anything on your own or ever use any of your personal finances. So you're doing two things, you're leveraging, and now you're essentially wrapping with some compound interest or some exponential growth on your finances. The other type is through human leverage. So the, this is something that is very, very interesting for corporates that we work with a lot is larger corporations or even just mid, middle, mid-sized corporations, typically when they get their, their um, innovation, they outsource it. Some of them have very, very small departments in innovation. Some of them have a little bit bigger ones, but a lot of times they outsource it. So if they're going to build a new product line or want a new service, they outsource to somebody, they get bids, they look for new startups that could potentially help them which is very common and it's not a bad thing, but it's very uh, um, impractical considering that they have an ex existing organization that may have the skill set. So the example I like to use is typically you have an organization. So here's all the departments up at the top here. You have engineering, HR, PM, finance, you know, whatever it may be, the, the technical office. And you typically have one or two people out of the entire organization that are deemed as the ones that need to generate the innovation. So they may, of course, use external resources and uh, research labs and white papers or whatever they can get their hands on. But they're really tasked to say, look, you are tasked to be the innovators, which is very, very obviously challenging. I've been tasked with that many, many times before. And like I said before, a lot of times it's expected to be this very disruptive, explosive type of innovation. So you're really kind of setting these people up for failure. Sometimes it works but very many minimal times it actually works is why they, uh, corporations tend to outsource it. The idea behind this is you essentially have a lot of people within the organization that have the right skill set in order for you to innovate. So in the example that I gave earlier on the conversational AI is we do uh, have a ton of people that were internally that were able to actually develop what we are able to build. Many times we would go outside to get somebody that can do that. But the thing is the people internally are extremely motivated. They know your business 
they have a, 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 a lot of resources and skill sets that you're not even familiar with. So about three years ago, what we did is we started to go through all of our employees and really understand, typically when you, you look at an employee and you onboard them, you look at them for like 20 minutes, you kind of look at their uh, you know, background and history and education, and then once you decide to hire them, you don't really ever have that conversation again. You assume that they've kind of grown internally um, and they have some new skill sets, but you, you quickly forget even as a manager what your team is able to offer. Uh, so typically that kind of goes to the wayside. So if you've had somebody there for four years that you forget, you know, they came from Tesla or NASA or they, you know, were a Harvard graduate with an MBA or whatever it may be that they bring to the table, we tend to box them into whatever we brought them on as. So, hey, look, if I brought you on as a, uh, you know, an HR person and I forget that you have a, you know, a background in artificial intelligence, that would be strange, but it, it happens. Um, then we typically box them into just HR. We're not going to go to that person and say, hey, can you help us with our new AI project? So what we did is we went through all of our employees and really identified what skill sets they have based off of their history and what interests they have. So the idea here is that essentially we're leveraging our internal employees to catapult our innovation by not just relying on one or two individuals, but rather to almost crowdsource, if you will, innovation across all of our different employees and allow them to be extrinsically motivated to work on things that one, they're, they have the skill set for, and two, they're extremely passionate about. So uh, I know we're getting close on time, so I'll kind of leave you with this. Uh, this was kind of my challenging question. So if you were use, if you use compounding leverage to grow your wealth, develop yourself and drive innovation, you would create a change that not only impacted your world, but those of the generations to come. So I really believe that if you were able to, you know, sit down and understand practically how you could use something, um, you know, like this exponential curve, but in a way that you can leverage it that you can both change your personal growth and development, your financial state, as well as you know, the innovation that you may be working on within your own company or somebody else's company in a new way of working. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sam. That was amazing content. Uh, we have a couple of questions, uh, but just to be mindful of time, I just wanted to go through a quick, sorry, I just, just wanted to go through our slide deck really quick one more time. So just a reminder, everybody, again, we have our next Lunch and Learn February, uh, February 5th, uh, the one following that March 5th, and we're looking for speakers. And I just wanted to thank you, everybody, for attending. We're going to now just go back and um, do some Q&A. So please follow us on our website and email us if you have any other questions. So uh, Sam, I'll hand it back to you. Uh, I had a question actually is how can governments, especially like the U.S. government, keep up with innovation? It seems like, you know, like you mentioned at Talis, it's somewhat problematic because there's, you're dealing with the world's largest bureaucracy <laughs> and democracy at the same time. But you know, and then there, we're fighting against companies like Uber and, you know, the gig economy and COVID, like, you know, they did this emergency approval for the vaccine, but the companies are innovating far quicker than government regulations can keep up. So do you know what's kind of happening in that space? And Yeah, great question. And I think it, it's, it's very relevant because even within aerospace, we're not as slow as government, which is surprising, but we are extremely, extremely slow. And you typically face that when you have so many regulating bodies and you have so many safety standards in place. So I think one of the biggest things is that, is that they need to practice some of this in terms of leveraging uh, some of the resources that they have. So that could be, you know, leveraging and improving technologies as a whole. And it really is kind of getting them to adapt a lot quicker than they are, which is extremely, extremely, extremely challenging. So, you know, governments is a little bit of a different topic than a kind of a private entity. But I think that they have to absolutely follow the same type of standards that they, you know, see from larger corporations and adaptability from, you know, companies like Uber or Google or Facebook. Absolutely. follow up to that, is there some sort of innovation 
team within the government. You know, I mean, I think some of it may be because there aren't as many young people in the big government offices as, you know, um, my brother, for example, he works at the Na National Science Foundation, but, you know, and he's a younger guy, but how is innovation kind of, is there a department that is trying to change? Yeah, government? yeah absolutely. And, and there is, a, I'll say, yes, there is a, a department and there's a department in a lot of large firms, whether it's an engineering firm or a government firm. And that's kind of what I was alluding to as part of the problem is because they're really segmenting it out. And you have a lot of things popping up like accelerators and incubators, which are great, but they're really desegmented from the, you know, the actual governing body. So what they typically, what you typically see is that the innovation department is accelerated in a far and beyond, and they're throwing kind of you know, darts at the wall, hoping that the governing body is going to, you know, pick one of them up and say, yes, we want to adapt to that, rather than actually changing the, the organization itself. And I think it's right now, it's, it's kind of been just a band-aid because what ends up happening is a lot of times it's more of a marketing stunt that corporations and governments use to say, hey, look, we're creative, we're innovative, we're throwing millions of dollars in innovation and they create a cool innovation hub and, and they showcase some of the things that they're trying to do. But in all reality, they haven't done anything and they're ultimately, you know, creating even a, a, a larger separation from their organization. Because a lot of the statistics that we found when actually working with corporations is almost everybody wants to be part of innovation, right? They, when you ask about it, hey, do you want to be creative and innovative? A lot of people went to school, especially engineers, but all different, you know, backgrounds went to school because they want to work on something cool. They want to be part of something really, really big and exciting. And when you come to a monotonous job every single day where you're you know, pushing papers or having high regulated bodies, it's very, very challenging. So opening the door for your own employees and engaging them to say, hey, I want you to be creative and innovative, um, then it's a, it's a really great way to start. And kind of to second back on your other question, one thing that we did was what we call a waste elimination day, where essentially we challenged departments of our own to say, where is the waste within your department? And how can you eliminate that and incentivize them however it may be. But people are, you know, super fast to jump on, on the train and say, I know so many places that I waste so much time every single day. And it's a very, very small change that they can make in order to make, you know, their operations move a lot more quickly. So there's some practices that they can apply, uh, whether it's a government or a, a private firm to very quickly adapt and change some of their processes. Thank you so much. Uh, I don't know if you can see the chat. Um, my sister's kind of posted a lengthy question. Oh, yeah. You can just ask it. The... Um, I, can, I can ask it. Hi, this is Pyle. I'm, I'm Pooja's sister. Hi. <laughs> um, I'm also an anteater. Um, so one, thank you for the great presentation. This is super insightful. Um, I had a question. I actually work in product innovation at AT&T and um, I really like the part about leveraging new tech and you know just thinking outside of the box. Um, are there, you know, when I think about industries like government, aerospace, are there innovation firms or consulting agencies that are focused on leveraging this new tech to infuse it into these companies that either don't have those resources, don't exercise, do this exercise of crowdsourcing within mm -hmm. their, their employees um, so that they can actually find new ways to grow their business, especially during a time like COVID when their revenues are down more than 50%. Yeah, absolutely. There, there is, um, and we've, I personally used them before, um, and I could even share those, but what I will say about that is even just engaging your employees on that topic. So if your company was able to look internally and say, you know, look, what are some new ways that we can engage our user base in this current, you know, pandemic is a very, very interesting way to kind of start the conversation because, you know, a lot of the people internally on their they're, of course, they're there working their computers on their kind of day to day. But at night, guess what they go home and do? A lot of them go home and read up on the latest technology. A lot of them are building little mm -hmm. prototypes yeah. with their kids. A lot of them are in their garage, you know, trying to build their own startup. They all have this really cool personal life that we saw that, you know, we actually started to kind of like even go into people's garages and be like, whoa, you, you, you know, people have built like electric cars in their garages. And we're like, whoa, we have really cool people working for us. And I think that's something that, 
you know, you can start off with rather than, you know, finding an agency to start and even an agency that could help you do that is possible. But even just, you know, you personally as kind of that, you know, that, that change agent in your organization can, you know, challenge the status quo and say, look, let's see what we can utilize our own employees for. It could be just a two day initiative where we get together and say, Hey, here's some of our, our user base pain points, or here's some of our company pain points. And people are so ready to help you answer those because they may not have the opportunity to speak. They may not have the opportunity to, you know, share those, but a lot of times they actually do have the answers and can really help you answer some of those questions. We did the same thing with us for, you know, we, we deal with commercial airlines and it's been very, very difficult, obviously, because they're canceling a ton of flights and, you know, nobody wants to fly. So we needed to say, okay, look internally with our employees and say, what can we possibly do to re-engage people to, to make them trust and feel feel safe and excited about flying again, which is a very, very challenging thing to do. And the idea is because people fly and they, they know our customer base and they know what we can do in terms of technology capabilities. we never had to go externally because people were able to bring that to the table and really make some you know, game changing type of decisions and offerings for our customer base. Uh, thank you for that. I, I'd say, yeah, if you do have some of those um, firms or something, whether if, yeah. you, if it's easier to share with um, Pooja, and then she can forward it to me. I, I, I'd only ask that because um, while I love the idea of crowdsourcing within the employees, there is, um, I think, especially with older companies yeah. that, including my own right now, that sometimes it's easier to take that feedback from an external party than from your own employees. And it's just something that I've just seen that your employees can have the same idea, but once it's kind of recommended from an outside party, somehow. Yeah, it's, yeah right. It's, it's worth 10 times more. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and but they're paying really 10 good. times more too. Yeah, 100%. I want to be paid 10 times more. <laughs> yeah. Yo, and I'll be very, very honest. You know, I, I love the company I work for, but it was the very same way because we're you know, an older company. And when we originally right. presented the idea, everybody, it was kind of like, you can do it, but no, don't tell anybody I said yes, right? Because they didn't want to be on the hook when, yeah. you know, the ideas came to surface right. and all of them stunk. So, it, and once it started to make traction, they're like, okay, some of these actually are working and customers are interested. We finally had to turn around. So I get it. Absolutely. So maybe we could start, you know, you could start with a consultant agency on that one. And then they can also suggest potentially using some internal employees and it, 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 it takes some time. Yeah, that, that'd be great. And, um, but I, I won't, I know there's other questions, so I won't take up all the time, but, um, I'm going to send you a message because, uh, I have some ideas on aerospace innovation that maybe, maybe we can find some partnership opportunities on. Yeah, I would love that. All awesome. right. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. You're welcome. Me, my sister and I are both former consultants. So <laughs> I, I do, I do change management and, you know, I was working. Oh, there you go. L3 in Mississippi. I also worked at Raytheon here, but I worked at L3 in Mississippi and one of the projects, you know, the questions like when I'm doing their process flows and things like, why do you do it this way? Just because I was told to do it this way and yeah. nobody told me to do it any different. And so I think sometimes in that kind of employee setting with um, unions or, you know, just someone who's just like, hey, I'm going to retire. This is my eight to five. If they're not intrinsically wanting motivated it's just like well i was just told to do it this way and i just do it because that's how i was told to do it yeah yeah i think yeah. that can be a yeah. hindrance right so i guess that leads me to my my other question is what recommendations do you have for personal innovation and and even as a family and having kids um i kind of see this play out a little bit with my kids um with the education system in a way is also so rigid it's like well you have to do this course and that course and you know, is it really helping to foster that innovative spirit? Because it's just like, well, you have to do this assignment, do this, and it's just the same rhetoric or that's been followed for years on end. And I know some schools are trying to change that a little bit where it's no homework and a lot more group work, but that's not the majority. <laughs> it's, yeah. You know, a few STEM schools only are doing that. Yeah, you know, I would say two two big things on that is, you know, there are a lot of resources in order to get kids creative. You know, there's these STEM boxes and things like that that are always just more fun that can be done with the family. But I would say more on the bigger light is, you know, we 
I, and I, I don't want to be educational here because I don't know enough about the education system to give you any, you know, true feedback on that. But what I will say is that um, we honestly need to start teaching our children. I have kids myself and we try to really teach them thinking outside of the common kind of linear boundaries as I kind of introduced in this presentation is because we have all typically grown up, like you said, in a very linear path for both our finances, the way that we typically, you know, grow in terms of our, our education and our, and our careers is that there are ways for us to, you know, come outside of these boundaries to accelerate some of those things. So it's in teaching them a little bit about, you know, finances is always a really cool thing that, you know, is a fun way to do. You could put it in a fun way to do without being so boring. One example of that just very quickly is one of our employees, this comes back to, to learning about our employees. One of our employees, when I went to his house, he was having a hard time with his kids kind of acting out and, uh, you know, like we all do, I guess. And so he tried to put in place, you know, a reward system and it wasn't working that well. So what he did is he took like those little Amazon buttons that you can buy on Amazon that typically you could press and, you know, they'll get your tide or something for you. And they had some open source ones. So he was able to, he's a developer, but he could work with somebody. He was able to quickly develop something where every single time it would be like a monetary value. Every single time the kid was good or did something that was, you know, did their homework or was able to, you know, do something on time, they click the button and a, you know, a virtual dollar would, would pop up and he was able to buy things like, you know, time on his game console or, you know, a pizza or anything like that with this kind of virtual money for doing good things. And every time, you know, things bad would happen, he would take money away out of his account, you know, but it was a very fun way to teach them, you know, how to be practical with finances, a little bit of how the, the world works and being creative. So I think us as parents need to be a little bit more creative on ways that we interact because we can't just completely rely on the education system because I think there's obviously a lot of changes that, you know, a lot of people are hoping for that. And I think it's extremely difficult now without the interactive component that a lot of kids are missing, you know, having to be on Zoom. So I think that's a, maybe a whole presentation in itself that somebody else can do, but I could definitely help them. Well, um, I think there was a, a speak uh, a lecture that Neil deGrasse Tyson gave, and he said that kids are actually natural born scientists and they want to experiment and they want to yeah. jump on the sofa, but parents are actually the inhibitors and saying, no, you can't touch the electricity. You can't do that. And it's like, well, let them touch the electricity and find out that they're going to get a spark or let them fall off yeah. the sofa and they'll learn about gravity and yeah yeah Earth. absolutely and so that's you know very interesting and yeah and i, I kind of curious you know as because you know we are doing a speak uh talk about uci is like is you know as a big institution and the computer science department you know are the right skills going out that mm -hmm. employers are looking for and you know not just that hey i took this class and i did this project and you know maybe that's obviously a different conversation yeah yeah i would love to talk about that though absolutely uh i don't know if anyone else has any other questions i didn't want to hog up all your time but it's a very interesting topic hey sam great con great content great presentation really exciting. thank you um, I was curious, just in terms of talking about thinking outside the box, I saw um, in your list of companies, there was one that said, think outside the box. What, what is that company? Yeah, that's exactly, it's kind of like a consulting firm where we actually go and act, and help employees think outside of the box. So our identity in that is really to create entrepreneurs is kind of the, the tagline behind what we do is because a lot of people and not everybody, we don't expect everybody's a, this kind of entrepreneur within organizations, but there are a large number of people that are entrepreneurs that want to cr be creative and innovative and, and are really inspired to do work. So what we do is we go in and we really try to help kind of surface those individuals and give them the right resources and platform in order for them to really accelerate within the business and you know essentially create what we consider kind of internal startups to the organization so we put on like hackathon events for organizations um we do like i said those waste elimination days things like that mostly oh that's cool very cool and puja i think you're you're poking down the right path with innovation in the schooling system. I think that one's due for some exponential growth. Yeah, I mean, uh, 
my um, my daughter's uh, in kinder, so she's doing actually all virtual. And my son is doing this hybrid where he goes two times a week. And some of it, I'm like, I kind of like it. I'm like, this would be nice if it stuck around because mm -hmm. it gives him time to do all these activities in kind of daylight hours, especially with it turning dark and not having to do everything out of school and supplementing with Kumon and science out of school. Now he kind of can manage his own time in a way and own his own education. And so it's kind of nice. I mean, he's only a second grader, but I, I'm curious how middle schoolers and high schoolers feel. Obviously the social part, you know, that social interaction is a, missing a little bit, but. Yeah, yeah, but I think, you know, to that point, I think one other important topic is that, you know, there are some, some teachers out there that are just absolutely super creative, go above and beyond and really instilling some innovation practices and, you know, creativity into students. But unfortunately, that's kind of been in a bubble, right? Mm -hmm. Almost all of us think in the past that say, oh, I had this one teacher that was very influential in my life or his way of teaching or her way of teaching was so, you know, impractical compared to the rest that it really changed me. And I think if we can leverage that in the way that we do with like employees, and really kind of transpire that to a lot more uh, students, then maybe we can benefit in that, that light. And it's not just like one class that everybody wants that one specific teacher or, you know, whatever it may be to kind of leverage what they're doing and apply it in a lot larger uh, picture. Yeah, and I feel there's so much going on, especially, you know, in high school um, where kids are trying to get their extra credit hours or their extracurricular and volunteer. And it'd just be nice if some of that could really extend you know, into the later years, I guess. Yeah. But there's only 24 hours in a day. I believe um, John had some comments about innovation with kids. I don't, John, if you want to just. Just a quick comment. So I, I have had the opportunity or the pleasure to work with kids for going on 20 plus years and uh, anywhere from ages to middle school all the way, you know, I call them kids when they get to college too. Mm -hmm. so I think their brains are fully formed for, you know, well into their 20s. So three, three basic groups, middle schoolers, high schoolers, and college age kids with a program that uses a four-step approach. And it uses um, this idea of visioning. I'm sure, Sam, you've done a lot of this stuff before, but we call it purpose. And the second part of it is people, third part of it is a product or something you're going to do, and then a plan. Mm -hmm. And we do it in an environment where we bring the kids into a group setting and we empower them to go do something themselves. And they have to figure it out with slight massaging from the mentors and allowing them to figure out that they really do own this thing. So we've done it locally. We did it at a high school in Santa Ana over the last uh, four or five years. And we bring in a, a, a kernel of kids, five kids typically, we grow it to 50 over a few weeks and we do a 14 week program where we empower them to go make some big change in their area, small uh, uh, community or a larger community. And we bring mentors in from, in fact, a bunch of mentors came from UCI over the last couple of years and older mentors. And we uh, teach them how to think for themselves by challenging them and providing them programmatic material. It's a 14 week program. It's now wrapped around a nonprofit I founded five years ago called Rainmaker Effect. But it's amazing how innovative and smart the kids are without adults telling them how to do things. And it works. John, did yeah, you say that was called Rainmaker? Rainmaker Effect. Yeah, and the, the website is Rainmaker Effect, E F F E C dot, dot O R G. If you could pop that into the chat, that would be great. Thanks for sharing that. It's fascinating. I do think kids are innovative when left to their own and to do it with each other. So we have to find our inner kid and our inner entrepreneur, right? That's right. The adults That's that are messing it all up. <laughs> yeah. 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 Like what Paul said, it's the uh, people within the group, the older uh, folks probably, to keep the innovation from happening because it wasn't done that way before. Why would you change it? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And I think some of that, yeah, it is that way of thinking, right? So I don't know if that comes from the top in a way because it's the management and stuff can stifle that growth by saying, hey, just do it the way you're told to do it. 
Well, great conversation. I don't know if anyone had any last comments. We have a couple minutes left. Last call. <laughs> I mean, uh -huh. I have more questions, but not in five minutes. <laughs> One. No, I'm kidding. I'll, I'll talk to you offline, Sam. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you guys so much for having me today. Very, very fun topic. So I'll talk about it anytime. Yeah, feel free to reach out to me. I'd love to chat. Well, thanks, uh, Jen, uh, for connecting us. And thank you so much for taking time. I know it's probably a very busy time for you at the beginning of the year but this is a great topic uh, for people for planning for 2021. So really, really appreciate your time. Yes, absolutely. Thanks. Okay, thanks.